number 112842, State of Kansas v. Clapp. May it please the court. My name is Caroline Zuschek. I'm with the Kansas Appellate Defender Office. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Philip Clapp. And if I may, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Um, a brief summation of how we got here today. Mr. Clapp pled guilty to a number of drug crimes and was given probation with an underlying sentence of 110 months. He violated his probation, and for his first probation violation, the district court imposed a 180-day sanction. For his second probation violation, the district court revoked his probation and imposed his underlying sentence. He appealed, arguing that it was an illegal sentence to give him improper probation violation sanctions, um, and the Court of Appeals affirmed the district court. He filed a petition for review, and here we are now. And actually, defense counsel requested that 180-day sanction. Yes. Is that correct? They did. Um, however, I would note that that was the um, recommendation of the probation officer. And at that hearing, the state was requesting that his sentence be imposed in its entirety. Um, does that, how does that matter if... if it was still the defendant's request that it be the 180 days. Has he waived any objection to that being the first? Um, no, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that it's our contention that he was ultimately given two illegal sentences and that the sanctions imposed on him were illegal. And those can be, you can't invite an illegal sentence um, and you can't agree to one. Um, Secondly, uh, even if he requested the, an improper sanction at the first probation revocation hearing and this court determines that that was invited error, I don't believe that that absolves the district court of their duty to properly apply the statute at the second hearing when he would have still been titled to um, a 100, another 180-day sanction based on the way that the statute is written. How can um, you say that? The, the statute specifically says you can only have one 180 day. Um, I don't know exactly what it says, but it's pretty explicit that you can only use that sanction once. Right, and I misspoke. My point was that the statute is also fairly clear that he's entitled to two technical violations and two sanctions on the graduated scheme. But how would that happen? Well, the district court had the discretion to um, I believe also impose a 120 day sanction. Um, it could have imposed a 60 day sanction in a different section, or it could have done a two to three day dip at that. So time. to follow the to to follow the statute, you're saying that the district court, after having imposed a 180 day, then had to impose a lesser sanction in other in order to follow the graduated sanction statutes. I'm saying the district court has to give a probationer two, at least two chances on probation before revoking for a technical violation. That's what the statute says. It says before you give... No, it doesn't say that. That's it says before you give a 180-day <laughs> sanction, you have to have given a two- or three-day sanction or reassign the probationer to community corrections. And it says before you revoke and impose, you have to have given a C1C or a C1D sanction. And the or purpose a C1, of these, or a C eight or a C nine exception, right? Or a C eight or C nine exception, um, but unless an exception applies, which is the second part of my argument, um, a probationer is meant to get three chances um, before being revoked for a technical violation. And it's our position that if you skip the first time and then say that's okay, you can immediately go on, then you're absolving the district court and the prosecutor of the duty to make sure the law is fairly applied in that circumstance. So fairly applied in your estimation is the number of tries that you get, the number of strikes that... The yeah, I think that that's the most relevant and most important part, particularly for probationers in Mr. Clapp's position where his underlying sentence was 110 months. So we're talking about... And and he's uh, he's 
currently incarcerated and was on probation for drug crimes. And these, the graduated sanctions was partially to acknowledge the fact that probationers need multiple tries to get things right, especially when they're suffering from addiction. Um, at any rate, if the, uh, even if, it, it's our position that um, even if he requested the 180 days at the first hearing, that was nonetheless an illegal sentence. Um, we believe this because the statute at the time said an illegal sentence can be corrected at any time. It has, of course, since been modified to include language from this court, which was in existence at the time, which defines an illegal sentence as something by, imposed by a court without jurisdiction, something that's ambiguous, and something that does not conform to the statutory provision, either in character or the term of punishment authorized. And here we have a statute. The first sanction did not conform to the statute, either in terms of character or type of punishment authorized, as the imposition of a full underlying sentence was not authorized, nor was the imposition of 180 days for a first sanction. Um, so we believe that 2237.16c is the sentencing statute at a PV, at a probation revocation, and that when you impose a sanction that isn't enumerated within the statute, you impose an illegal sentence. And why is it a sentence? He's already been through a sentencing. Right, and we're not disputing that the underlying sentence and, 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 itself is legal. And we have, we have case law that says the sentence is the judgment, it's final. Um, so why is imposing probation sanctions a sentence? Well, because he is being punished for the conduct while on probation, and the punishment is the imposition of the previously imposed sentence. And we would argue that that is an, of itself a sentence. And this isn't well, a novel well, argument. I, I see that. I see that with the ultimate uh, revocation and send to prison because you've changed the character there from non-prison sanction to a prison sanction. Correct. And uh, the statute under C1E speaks of a lesser sentence, and so it speaks to resentencing. But how do we how do we uh, uh, apply that same rationale to the two-day mini dips and the 120, 180-day uh, bigger dips? Well, um, first of all, to do so wouldn't be novel. This court has done it before. Um, in the previous iteration of the probation revocation statute, there was a provision that says you can extend probation beyond the initial term only if you find and set forth with particularity the reasons that this will harm the public safety or the offender's welfare. And at times when the court extended the probation under that statute without making the particularized findings, this court held that that was an illegal sentence. Um, and that was also just an extension of probation. It didn't change the underlying term, and yet it was illegal. It was an illegal sentence because we're playing with semantics a bit with probation. We call it a disposition, but in actuality, we're talking about violations that the offender commits that result in a punishment. And it's our belief that this is exactly what the illegal sentence statute was designed to address. What um, case do you think best stands for that point of... In the, under the prior sentencing statute and the particularized findings? Um, I have that in my notes. If I can, of course, flip to it quickly, um, that would be amazing. If you want to supply it on rebuttal, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know on rebuttal. I do have that written down. I just can't seem to locate it, so I'm sorry. I was saying that <laughs> um, there was a case that did that, but that isn't the only instance with the particularized findings. Um, also, if a court extends probation after probation has lapsed, that's an illegal sentence. It's We call a sentence something that occurs when the court imposes any sort of restriction on a probationer's liberty without the statutory authority to do so. Um, 
And public policy also supports applying the statute in the way that Mr. Clapp requests. If you find that it's not an illegal sentence to skip a probation violation sanction, then probationers like Mr. Clapp never have recourse. Um, obviously, if you skip a two or three day dip and go immediately to 120 days, the 120 days run before we ever get this case before the court. Um, furthermore, the Court of Appeals has held that the defendant has to specifically request a sanction under 223716 for it to be heard on appeal and that it's not sufficient just to request a lesser sanction than what the state did. So they're barred from getting relief unless their counsel specifically mentioned um, 223716. And so the option then would be to say, well, their counsel was ineffective for not talking about the statute properly. However, that doesn't work either because by the time they would be entitled to, you know, a 1507 on ineffective assistance of counsel, we're taught most of these people have already served their sentences. So if this court holds that it's not an illegal sentence, then these probationers who's, who are not having the statutes fairly applied to them don't have recourse to address the problem. Um, so we need a mechanism for them to be able to raise it for the first time on appeal. Um, and we need it to be able to get it prior bad sanctions um, so that the whole of the statute can be affected and the purpose of the statute can be affected. Counsel, uh, at the Court of Appeals, it appears to me that this argument um, proceeded a a along a different track with respect to arguing whether or not our case law in State v. Edwards was correctly decided in good law. And um, in Edwards, we said that the statutory provision at issue in an illegal sentence claim is the statute defining the crime and assigning the category of punishment. And that's not, you're making a different argument now, as I understand it. You're saying the statutory provision at issue is the probation revocation statute. Yes, and that was always our point. Um, the Court of Appeals... Do, so then my question then is, do you, do you still, and this is just from the Court of Appeals opinion, they recite that... Uh, Mr. Clapp argued that Edwards was wrongly decided. Yeah. What's your position on that? Okay, we never, Mr. Clapp never argued that Edwards was wrongly decided. Um, he simply said that Edwards is completely pro properly decided, but the Court of Appeals has been misapplying it. The Court of Appeals has taken Edward to say, um, conform to the statutory provision either in character or terms of punishment imposed. First of all, we think those words apply to probation revocation statutes because... Um, well, how do you distinguish the language in Edwards then? That, that seems to indicate that it doesn't apply to probation revocation statutes. In fact, it applies only to the statute under which the defendant was originally sentenced for the crime. Um, that was the only sentencing provision at issue in Edwards. Um, in Edwards, he was arguing that his convictions violated double jeopardy because... Uh, he was arguing a problem with his conviction. It wasn't even a statutory case. Right, not at all. So and, but only... you haven't argued dicta. Right. Because dicta is not binding on anyone, including those that pro uh, propound it. Correct? Exactly. But you haven't argued that it was dicta. Uh, I intended to argue that it was dicta in both my reply brief and in my petition. Um, my first argument is that you can apply that language to this case because I think that we're talking about um, a statutory provision and a term of punishment that's not authorized. But if you disagree with that and you think that that language does narrow it too far, doesn't apply to probation revocations, then it was dicta and therefore doesn't control the interpretation here. And moreover, the cases are distinguishable because in that case, there wasn't a statute at issue at all. And here we're talking about a specific statute that defines a punishment. And just so, just so I'm clear, you are not conceding that Edwards is somehow controlling, as it appears the Court of Appeals interpreted your argument? No. Um, okay. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Um, I see that I'm out of time. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any more questions of counsel? Yes, Chief. Uh, what does character mean? The, the second uh, definition of illegal is that the sentence does not conform to the statutory provision uh, in either character or term of punishment. What's the character of pun punishment? 
Um, my interpretation would be that it's whether the disposition, um, whether it's um, probation or prison, and then term would be the second part. So here, he should have been given a two to three day jail sanction, then a 180 day prison sanction. So it's a term that we're arguing with, not the disposition. And so there's really nothing in the statute that defines a crime or that establishes the severity level of that crime that dictates the character. Because well, that would have to be the two-part equation with the criminal history and it would be the sentencing guideline statutes that would determine that, wouldn't it? Yes and no. I mean, I think this language is broad enough to include the probation statute because it does define, you know, if you commit a new crime, then the character of punishment authorized <coughs> would be the full revocation and imposition of the underlying sentence. Um, but if you commit only a technical violation, such as repeated drug use or failing to call your probation officer, then the character should be a jail sanction followed by a prison <coughs> sanction. Um, but you're right, I think that language could be construed and, and has been, obviously, by the Court of Appeals to include only um, criminal sentencing guideline statutes. Um, but even if that's true... I think you misunderstand what... I'm sorry. I was trying to help you here, that, that the statute defining the crime does not uh, have any... does not establish the character of the punishment. Because you have to go from the oh, elements right. defining crime <laughs> yes. to the, the Sentencing Guidelines Act that takes you to the grid, that takes you to the probation or non-probation uh, 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 prison or, or non-prison sanction. Right, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> any further presentation? Um, I'll reserve the remainder of my time if any for a little. Any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. May it please the court, counsel, state appearance by Assistant District Attorney Daniel Gilligan of Reno County. Mr. Clapp is asking for uh, relief uh, in the form of a new probation revocation hearing. Uh, the state's position is that a new probation revocation hearing would, would serve no purpose. Uh, the court made it very clear uh, when it ruled at the district court level that Mr. Clapp was a danger to society, uh, that he was a danger to himself, and that the exception to the graduated sanctions provision uh, allowed for under uh, KSA 22-3716C9 uh, would be applicable to Mr. Clapp. Um, Can you point me to uh, the portion of uh, the judge's statement that fits the requirement of setting forth with particularity the reasons for findings, the safety of the public, members of the public will be jeopardized or the welfare of the offender will not be served. Uh, I, I think I agree with you, the general tenor uh, of uh, Judge McCarville's uh, recitation um, would indicate that, but how is that setting forth with particularity? Well, and, and that's why I argue that a new uh, probation revocation hearing would not serve Mr. Clapp's purpose because I believe that if this court were to uh, remand it back for another probation revocation hearing, that would simply give Judge McCarville an opportunity to, to outline the particularity that he did. To do it right. Exactly. And wh why isn't that, why isn't that uh, a, a purpose to be served to uh, comply with with due process and, sure. and the requirements of, of uh, uh, that are necessary to deny someone their liberty interest. Sure. Well, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that Judge McCarville didn't give enough particularity in his. I think that outlining the crimes of conviction that he did uh, and outlining in particular the uh, weapons convictions indicate that the defendant was a danger to the community. Uh, certainly, the, the testimony that was heard indicated that Mr. Clapp was a danger to the community. Um, 
I know that Mr. Clapp argued in his brief uh, that he was not a danger to the community because he didn't have any person felony convictions, but uh, that indicates that uh, the criminal discharge of a firearm isn't a dangerous offense, and, and it is a dangerous offense. Criminal discharge of a firearm means that he was essentially involved in a drive-by shooting, and it's so serious that the state has put that and enumerated it, and the Asset Forfeiture Act is something that we can take his car for uh, as a deterrent. So. Uh, Mr. Clapp was a dangerous person, and reciting those convictions indicates that the court acknowledged his dangerousness to the community. Uh, and certainly, uh, the information that the court had at the probation violation hearing was that uh, Mr. Clapp had gone on a, a three-day meth bender with uh, two women, and uh, the women are me members of the public. So if he's uh, taking them and subjecting them to meth use for three days, he's a danger to the community, at least two people in it. Uh, uh, so far, counsel, the only thing I've heard you say that was set forth by particularity by the district court judge is the fact of the underlying conviction. The underlying convictions? It? No. Yeah, the judge also said, uh, and the Court of Appeals tied into the language, I wish you had taken and cherished your chance at community corrections, uh, but I really just get the feeling that you thought that community corrections was something you were going to try and get through so that you could then go live your life the way you wanted to. I never have, and today still do not have the feeling that you actually valued community corrections as a way that could have helped you change how you think, how you live your life, so that you can be a productive, law-abiding citizen. Is any of that a, quote, reason for finding that the safety of, the, of members of the public is jeopardized? Well, and I think it's either the safety of the public or the defendant. I mean, Well, but he's... Uh, how is what you just read a reason for finding that the public safety is jeopardized? Uh, that if, the defendant uh, allegedly didn't care enough about community corrections? Well, and well, not only didn't care about community corrections, it was the types of violations that he had when he didn't care about community corrections. Again, he went out and had uh, drug use with other members of the, of the community. I understand that all those facts were maybe presented by the state or by witnesses. I'm looking more specifically to what did the district court judge quote, set forth with particularity. And, and again, the, the, the fact that the district court laid out his prior crimes, his, his crimes uh, of conviction in this state uh, case with the dealing drugs, not just one drug. He was so it is just the, prior, the, the recitation of the, prior, of the crimes of conviction. And, and the fact that having had those and then having had the opportunity at community corrections, he, he still wasn't complying with community corrections. Okay. If, you. if you have someone who has uh, a, a dangerous uh, disposition uh, and they're given an opportunity to correct that, he was given the opportunity of mental health treatment, drug treatment. Uh, he attended inpatient drug treatment right after he served the first 60-day sanction that he did serve all 60 days of. Uh, and then he went proceeded directly to inpatient treatment, went through that, and then immediately went out and used. And the courts in uh, Siebel and Howell acknowledged, uh, although they're unpublished opinions, that when the defendant poses a danger to themselves, as Mr. Uh, Siebel did when he tested positive, I believe after eight days uh, of relief, or after release, um, then, he, then uh, revoking his probation and ordering the underlying sentence served so, the community so interest. What I hear you saying is that not being amenable to probation means that uh, Mr. Clapp couldn't get the help he needed with his drug problem, which meant it wasn't uh, 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 to his welfare uh, uh, to stay on probation. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, sort of. I mean, it's not that he couldn't get the help, it's that he didn't take advantage of it. When it was well, but, but he's not amenable to probation, so therefore it's, it's not to his welfare to, to be on probation. Correct. And I, I think, don't we have an implication in there somewhere? I mean, how, do, how is that with uh, particularity? You're making the leap or inferring that because he didn't comply that this is going to be harmful for him um, if he doesn't go to to prison, and uh, I'm, I'm, that doesn't sound like a particular reason. It's a you know an inference or uh, implication. Well, and uh, of course, the court of appeals looked at both probation revocation hearings. The first one, 
uh, and the second one. And, and in that one, in the first one, the judge did set forth that uh, Mr. Clapp had not taken advantage of the mental health treatment, the inpatient treatment, was still testing positive for meth. And it, in, in the first one, said that he uh, basically was, when you aim for a ditch, you drive straight for the ditch as fast as you can because he was released from inpatient treatment, went right back to using, didn't uh, take advantage of mental health treatment. And I think the testimony of his probation officer at the last hearing uh, gives you a, an idea of his demeanor. Clapp will come in and tell me that he does not want to go to treatment. He doesn't have a drug problem. I've offered reintegration. He refused to go to reintegration. He basically is non-compliant with most of the rules. He does not want to do them. I actually tried to go over a thinking report with him. He simply refused to answer the questions. Uh, the first time uh, for his probation revocation hearing, he went to a casino and gambled uh, outside of his probation, as well as using, failing to attend treatment. The second time, he went to a motel out of county uh, and, and spent three days with, with two women doing meth. Uh, he, it, he's not like he just didn't comply with his probation. He really didn't comply really with his probation. Counsel, conceding that that's all in the record, um, are you arguing today that the correct process was was followed, that the correct procedure was followed here? Based on the language in Howell, the court in Howell did not specifically cite the statute, and that appeared to be what Mr. Clapp was arguing, that the district court needed to... Uh, I'm not sure that's a fair characterization of your opponent's argument. I think that what they're arguing is that the particularized findings were not made, aren't they? And that wasn't that didn't happen here, did it? The, the court did not specifically say the words, I find that you are a danger to the community because X, Y, Z. That is correct. Okay. And we have process rules for a reason. And cases get reversed because process isn't followed all the time, right? Even if everybody in the room knows that when it goes back, it's going to come True. out the same way. Okay. True. Thanks. Let's go to the statute. The uh, We didn't have what I'm going to call the mini dip, the two to three days, no more than 18. You'd agree that that wasn't actually um, present here? That's correct. And is there any way that the judge, in conformance with the statutory provisions, could have imposed that 180-day <laughs> uh, Department of Corrections sanction um, under those circumstances? Well, uh, and, and to be clear, the state argued for execution of sentence uh, at the first well, probation okay. but hearing. I'm just, but, I, but I, I, where I, I am is even, even under C-8 or C-9, they don't speak to those being exceptions to the 180-day sanction, do they? You understand what I'm saying? Right. And so that when you read the statute, the only way to get that 180 days is to have had the first mini dip. That that is, appears to be the intent of the statute, and, I would agree. And so the only way I can see that you can say that uh, uh, that 180 day was not a, a uh, sentence that did not conform to the character and term of punishment is to say it was not a sentence. Well, I... Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do you think, is there a way that you can argue to me that that was not a non-conforming sentence, the 180 days in this case? Well, the argument that I made was, of course, that the defendant had received an initial sanction uh, when he was first granted probation. He got a 60-day jail sanction when he was granted probation from as a departure at the time of at the time at, of sentencing, but but that's not a, Two a to three probation days. revocation or a technical violation sanction, is it? No. Okay. No. But okay, let's assuming that initial sixty days does not fulfill the mini dip. Right. Is there any way that that hundred and eighty day uh, could be, if it's considered a sentence? could have been a legal sentence? Uh, if it's considered a sentence, then I don't believe it would have been properly before uh, the district court to do that. Uh, 
that was it was not the position of the state that he should get a 180 day sanction. The only time it came up is when his attorney requested it, um, and and based on the request of his attorney uh, over the state's objection to, he was given the 180 day, and and that's why the states argued that he invited that error of the court, and he should not subsequently benefit for inviting that error. Uh, and then to, to think that having served a 180-day sanction, that a two- or three-day quick dip would serve anything when, as the defendant in indicated, he'd been in prison uh, shortly before, for, he had been out of prison for four months before he committed the crimes in this case. So he's already served a prison sentence and then done 180 days. If the state had uh, uh, asked for uh, revocation in the beginning without any graduated sanctions, that had been granted. The Department of Corrections then would have notified the court that, hey, you didn't follow uh, the graduated sanctions. Uh, uh, would you be precluded from uh, challenging that because you invited the error? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, we uh, what I'm saying is that, okay, uh, that wasn't a good example, but what, what I'm saying is if you end up asking for something that's not statutorily uh, uh, allowed, but it turns out to be fit within the definition of a illegal sentence, is are, are you bound because you asked for it? I, I, I would have to agree. If it is an illegal sentence, if it is an illegal sentence, then it has to be corrected. Then, then sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If, if defense asks for a, something that's an illegal sentence, if, if then we can't sentence. let it stand on invited error, can we? Uh, if it's a sentence, I would okay. agree. All right. Uh, if I, it's a sentence, all right. But I think that the court has ruled under Edwards that, that it is not a sentence. That the, why why the, isn't Edwards dicta? The, the sentence that you point to we have a case that involved a constitutional challenge to the sentence. And the allegation is illegal because it violated the Constitution. The statutory provisions weren't even involved. So the sentence that talks about which statutory provision is meant by the uh, statute had nothing to do with the holding in that case, did it? Well, and, and that, the, the point is that once that that decision came down in Edwards, the Court of Appeals has taken that, and we try to follow the Court of Appeals, and when they have cases like Howell and Siebel, uh, though unpublished opinions that say, hey, uh, this doesn't apply to probation revocation, uh, then that's what, we, that's what we have to go by. The difference is, is what's our precedent and what's the Court of Appeals precedent right. with regard to the binding effect or stare decisis with regard to our court, right? Well, yeah, we, we, we can only follow what we have, and, and the interpretations that we had said that it doesn't apply to probation revocation statutes. Um, when the um, graduated sanctioning scheme, however you want to call it, isn't implemented, what should be the mechanism that someone has to bring that, bring that before the court, before an appellate court on appeal? What, what should be the mechanism? Uh, I, I think that... Uh, uh, counsel mentioned that uh, ineffective assistance of counsel would work, that they weren't able to provide the court with the correct sanction. Uh, I, frankly, I, I'm not sure. It, it's, how. it's counsel's fault if, if the sanction isn't imposed? I mean, what this, the scheme isn't followed by the court, uh, it, so, so it's an ineffective assistance of counsel? issue? Well, and, and I, I need to separate. Certainly in Mr. Clapp's case where counsel said, I want a 180 day sanction, I think that counsel did, did the error. Uh, in general, uh, I would say that uh, I'm not sure how they're going to get relief as counsel has asked for before they've had an op they, they, it's moved, before the, the, the sanction has already been served. She's asking that it be considered an illegal sentence so that it can get before the court. But the reality is that a 120-day prison sanction is really 60 days, and a case isn't going to be before the court in, in 60 days. But it cuts both ways. 
the statute says you can only have the 120 day one time, you can only have the 180 day one time. If right. the district court uh, imposes consecutive 180 day sanctions, you have no way to get relief either. Right. Right? That's and true. If it's not an illegal sentence, then, then you're not going to get any relief from that. You're not going to change the, uh, be able to show the, the court the error of its ways. Uh, we would we would have to uh, I am I'm, I'm frankly I'm not sure yeah. any further presentation no you're not. any more questions thank you counsel reserve three minutes for rebuttal May it please the court. Um, Justice Lukert, I promised you a citation and I have found it in my notes. Um, the State versus Alonzo 296 1052, um, it's a 2013 case by this court, discusses how um, extending probation without making the particularized findings, um, the court lacks jurisdiction to do so in its new legal sentence. Um, also, in State versus Jones, 30 Can App 2D 210, syllabus paragraph 6, um, obviously that's a court of appeals case, which I recognize is not binding on this court, though this court did order it published, and it subsequently reversed uh, Shaw, or, yes, yeah, subsequently reversed the case Shaw, calling it controlling authority. Um, and in that case, the trial court's failure to set forth with particularity the requisite findings resulted in a legal sentence subject to appellate review. So those would be the best cases for that proposition. Um, other than that, I would just note that um, while some facts in the record might support finding that prison is the best place for Mr. Clapp or that might support finding he was presented a public danger, um, we require the specific and particularized findings to keep these provisions from being overly vague, and we would request that this court remand the case for a new probation revocation hearing. You count. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you went at this two different ways. On, on the uh, uh, first issue was illegal. On the second, that, that it was just error not to follow the statute. Correct. My problem with that is you're relying on the 180-day sanction being illegal, um, or, or, or being uh, 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 outside the provisions of the statute, but you didn't appeal that. So how can you... I understood that you went with the illegal sentence so that you could bring that earlier a uh, uh, problem in the play, but if you're going to go with a straight statutory violation, then why hasn't that ship sailed? And if you can't challenge that 180 days, then how do you get to the fact that the revocation is uh, uh, outside the statute when the statute says after 180 days you can revoke. Yeah. Um, are, are you following where I'm taking you? I, I think yeah. so. Uh, okay. So you can interrupt me if I'm not on the right track. But um, obviously the best vehicle for Mr. Clapp's case would be the illegal sentence vehicle. But I believe there isn't an alternate vehicle that we still run under, which is that it's the duty of this court to construe statutes as a whole. Um, so even though the specific provision that he was sanctioned under says you only need to have 180 days, um, that provision, if you read the 180-day one, says, oh, you can only have this if you've also had the two or three days. And so I think that even if you don't find that it's an illegal sentence, you can still find that the court erred in, in um, applying the statute. And yes, he probably should have appealed from the first um, hearing, but if he had, it would have been kicked as moot because it wouldn't have gotten to the court in time. Um, and we deal with this every day where there's, you know, fairly substantial issues of, you know, misapplication of the law and they're not being corrected and they're not getting here in time. Um, so that would be my best answer to that question. 
Council, there's been some discussion during the arguments this morning that perhaps, not for sure, the district court did not carefully follow subsection C9? Correct. In your view, what would be the minimum that the judge should have done here in order to satisfy C9? I'm revoking your probation because I find that you're a danger to the public in light of your criminal history and repeated drug use. That would be sufficient. It would at least say that he's relying on the exception and give a reason that's specific in particular. I don't think that we're asking the district court for a monologue of every little thing that they think is wrong, but I think we're asking for some clarity that that's even the exception that they're relying on, and I don't believe it can come from a prior hearing. Um, I think it has to be on the record at the hearing where that exception is relied on. So what the judge here failed to do after reciting all the weapons violations and all the prior problems, that was insufficient. He needed to cap it off with that summary you just provided. Ideally, yes, but also part of the problem is context. If you're if you look where in the probation revocation hearing the judge was talking about the weapons violations, he was like, well, here are the pros. You know, you have a job, you haven't absconded, you're still reporting, and here are the cons. You had a dangerous criminal history, and here are some of your violations. And then here are the pros, and here are the cons. That wasn't even in the, like, summation imposition of the underlying sanction. It was just sort of the court's um, verbal discussion of kind of what it was weighing. Um, and so had that all of those facts come at the end and the court didn't say the statute, I still don't think it would be enough, but that would be a lot closer. What, to... what if he had checked the box that's on the printed form that says he's applying the exceptions to C9? Would that, that would have helped, helped too. Case? Yeah, that would have helped, but I don't know that that would be the deciding factor. I mean, you can check the box and not make specific and particular findings. However, checking the box would lend uh, an appellate counsel reading the file to try and understand because here it appeared in the state's um, brief that it was arguing that maybe it was the public safety exception but maybe it was also the offender welfare portion of that statute and those are two entirely different things while I'm sure they can simultaneously exist different findings would probably be required for each and so there's just no if I can't tell reading the record I'm sure that Mr. Clapp was unclear as to what was happening at his own hearing. All right, thank you. Any further questions? I see none. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you so much. The court will take this matter under advisement.